my behavior changed even more so. I got to, um, I stopped being involved in any kind of drug activity, using or selling. Um, I was um, divorcing a lot of the people that I interacted with. And I, I spent a lot of time studying and all this kind of stuff like that. And um, I really, I utilized that time, the remainder of my census, like I said, I was in, I was incarcerated for 18 years and seven, seven months. And I spent the lion's share of that going to school, being involved in programs, running programs. And at some point, it, I got to the place, well, where I was um, really concerned about not just community, not just returning to the community, but returning to the community as an asset and not as a liability. You could get a little closer to the mic. Okay. Yeah, returning to the to the community as an asset, not, not as a liability. And I remember um, initially, I was um, I saw that I went before a parole board uh, at 16 years and eight months, right? And my the parole board chairman then was um, Maureen Waltz. I think she's a Chicopee judge now. Okay. And her and I got into an argument during my parole hearing because she said, well, she said, isn't relapse a part of rehabilitation? Some say, yes, it is. I say, so she said, so, so what you're telling us that you're going out, you're going to relapse, you're going to go back to using drugs. And you're going to start committing crimes. And I said, but no. I said, I rel relapsed at a time I could afford it, and which I did. Like, Ed, so at, I had been clean for maybe like about four or five years. And then one day someone gave me some weed, some marijuana, and I started smoking, not knowing that I was going to, you know. But anyways, but then, and I, and when I smoked it at that time, I got all paranoid, I really didn't like it, and I was like, get this stuff out of me. But the bottom line is, I got in trouble for, and I got uh, 15 days isolation. So that's what I was explaining to uh, Maureen Walsh at the board. I said, that reinforced my understanding that that's not where I'm at. I said, so the only thing, I said, I, I, it was convenient for me because only, I said, for me to learn about not using it and not relapsing, it cost me 15 days isolation and having to explain it to you, right? And so she, so they, at that point, at uh, during that hearing, first of all, at that hearing, it took six months for me to get an answer for them. That was a no. And at, and I was at, um, I was at Bay State where the majority of people was lifers or long termers. And Bay State is one of the prisons, and where is that? That's in uh, next in Norfolk, uh -huh. and and this typically have like the uh, first degree, second degree lifers and long termers there. And I was one of the few people there that didn't have um, a homicide, and I had did you know I had a. I basically earned a college education while I was there and everything like that. And so, and people, and w one of the things that I did um, going in front of the pro board at that time, um, we hired this person from Amherst, Ange DiBenedetto, to come in and do a psychological evaluation. Uh -huh. Because that's what they was requiring for people at that time for. So um, to determine whether or not they're, you know, after you've been locked up for a while, if you know, determine you're going to be violent or whatever when you come out. And so, and I was telling about all of the stuff that I wanted to do when I got out and everything like that. And um, so I presented all the stuff to the board, and they felt like that to see if I could handle disappointment. So they gave me a two-year hit, you know, a two-year setback. So. After 16 years and eight months, they gave me a uh, two-year setback to see what would I do. And I, there was only one other program that I hadn't um, gotten involved in. That was the Correctional Recovery Academy. So I went there. And I went at, at the two-year mark, I went back in front of the parole board. And I got a uh, unanimous this, this decision. I got my decision in two weeks. And I was out in like 45 days or something like that. And I came to... Uh, Bill Nagel's honor court here in Florence, uh -huh. and, and because I knew that 
uh, as a result, uh, and I advocate that people go into residential programs that's been locked up long, six months, six years, or 60 years to allow themselves to independently get on their feet. And, I, and that's one of the, um, the things that, that I did. And, um, but it, it was, the overall process has been really interesting in terms of um, the way my life, the way I have evolved and the way that my life has evolved as a result. Which was why another thing, another reason why it was, it was really devastating for this incident to happen to me recently, in August 3rd, 2011, where no matter what I do or don't do, all of a sudden I'm back 20, 30 years ago, right back where I begun. And it, the irony of it is, is being locked up, going back into the Department of Correction, one of the first things they did, they came up with this compass risk assessment, like, and that they created this personal program plan and immediately was telling about how I needed to go to a drug program and all. I'm like, for what? And he said, well, you have a drug, your substance abuse history, 30 years ago. Yes. But they people wanted to keep bringing me back, and that's what the overall issue is. For me, that as it's not about what I'm doing here today in the here and now. It's always about what what happened in 1983, where I was at in 1983. And and I understand from from a previous conversation, I think that uh, that during this time you've been on parole during this 11 years. Yes. Um, that you had periodic. Uh, urine test? I had urine tests every month. Breathalyzer. I mean, I I lost a finger and didn't lose and didn't um, where I was given opiates and everything. And I didn't abuse the medication. Matter of fact, I didn't even like the medication. You know what I mean? So I was off it as soon as possible. And but it's just that one dimensional identity. People view me as soon as they hear um, Donald Perry, felon or parolee. Everything else, nothing else matters. I mean, even to some people to say, well, why is he upset? I'm upset because of what happened to me. I mean, yes. I've worked hard, and one of the other things is that I've had, as a, as a black man, to accomplish as much as I've had in the last 20 years, I've had to work twice as hard as anyone else. You know what I mean? And I put my whole heart and soul into that. And for them, for someone just, I mean, they just want to refute all of the facts, all of the evidence for them to just say, well, um, I know this person is guilty of something. Yes. You know what I mean? Yeah. That just, and one of my pet peeves is, if I, if you know, it, don't don't tell me that I did something when I know I didn't do it, you know what I mean? That just really gets on the bad side of me. Now, one of the things you talked about earlier was this, this awakening you had that you wanted to, to not lead a negative life, but a positive life, which in fact you, you did both in jail, doing the educational programs and all the other programs of, of self-improvement um, or, or um, good awareness of yourself and, and your own integrity, having that reinforced, that you are a man of integrity. And um, so you go, so you do all of this while you're still in jail, and go through these hoops that um, that are just uh, that are devastating, and that you did not, even if you were periodically devastated, that that it didn't break your spirit, that your spirit is alive, and so when when you get out, what you do are these jobs that uh, even you're talking about the man you gave the ride to who, what your intention was, was to establish a rapport with him so that eventually you might be able to help him get on the path you're on. Right. Now, um, I'm curious about now because one of the things that I've, I've heard today, particularly in, and in other conversations, is, um, is looking at this, this draconian parole system um, I mean, it's it's absolutely um, inhumane. It's absolutely unjust, and and I wonder what what you and others, your attorney or other people, are doing to uh, to reform it, to change it, to to uh, to let people 
like me and our listeners know that this is a terrible part of our so-called justice system. Well, well I, I think that, so one of, one of my initial efforts at, at, or our initial efforts at this point is to raise awareness about this system because a lot of people don't know. And especially if you um, middle class white, you don't have to worry about this. You know what I mean? Because you are going to be afforded a different kind of justice. But if you are poor, uh, a person of color, then you're subjected to a whole different ball game. And when is enough enough? This is supposed to be about rehabilitation. And so what we are what we are doing is, we are, as I said, we are initiating a statewide campaign to bring to bring these issues to the attention of the legislators. As far as because uh, uh, again, uh, parole, probation, that's supposed to be about rehabilitation. And a lot isn't, it's being punitive. I mean, um, 2013, there was a, um, the, the uh, governor had appointed um, a, a, a council to do research about what the overall issues of Massachusetts parole. And they created what is called the um, white papers. And in there, it outlines some of the main issues. You know what I mean? Uh, as far as uh, rehabilitative incentives. Um, also, training the parole board members so they have insights to the stipulations that they be putting on people. I mean, you heard it your your own self when at my hearing they're saying like, oh, "Why did you want to go to A and N A meetings? I don't use drugs, so why you want to put me in the category with these people? Not that I'm better than anyone else, but rehabilitation is progressive. There's only so much one addict can teach another addict, and that person needs to move on. And so, <clears throat> I think that. The whole premise is simply to create a system where the, there's checks and balances. The parole board has someone looking over them to see what's going on. Where an individual such as myself, he or she has a, re, a, a means to, um, to uh, uh, petition against whatever conditions that they have that aren't suitable for them. You know what I mean? And that I think that we have to really uh, start thinking about not just punishing people, but helping people. And one of the and that's one of my pet peeves is like I remember at one point like I'd go months without seeing a parole officer, and I go down. And I'm like, what's going on? You guys need a urine. You need a breathalyzer. Well, they say, yo, get out of here. That you're wasting our time. And then it goes back to that one-dimensional identity. Everything that happened to me, I could not get my parole officer to try to deal with me or recognize me on a human level. I was a parolee to them. Yes. You know I mean? And I've had an array of things that happened from not only acknowledging my accomplishments, but even to my mother's death. I mean, I, I had to call, call up. A, um, I remember I went on vacation to see my mother in North Carolina. and. Um, I came back and I told the head of parole, I'm like, I was like, listen, I said, my mother's not doing well, she's on oxygen, so I might get that time, get a call any minute. I said, I'm giving you a heads up now. And they said, okay, yeah, fine, well, um, if something happens, we'll, 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 we'll take care of it. Okay. March 22nd of 2010, I get a phone call. Nine o'clock in the morning for my brother in Maryland. He said, I think something's happening. And ultimately, my mother had passed. I immediately called parole. Oh, you can't go to North Carolina. You, you have to um, get a copy of the death certificate and all that kind of stuff. That take much. So I had to call state representative at her house and tell her what my situation was. And she called parole. But and so we, we, that's what we need paroles to start doing, to be more and, um, concerned about the individuals rather than punitive. For, for our listeners who have, many of you have probably uh, read The New Jim Crow. I think uh, it's a very instructive book. And I think you are an example of somebody who has, who has lived through that New Jim Crow and are on the other side but, but not quite free of it yet, 
because you're still on parole, you still have limitations, you are not a free man. No. And what's the process for for freeing you from this Jim Crow system? Well, at, at this stage, I mean, enough is enough. I mean, and um, my lawyer, Luke Ryan, and I, we're now uh, going back in the court on, we're trying to go back in the court on a, on a motion of a Rule 30 to have my sentence vacated because I shouldn't, well, my punishment doesn't fit my crime. This is 30 years later. Everything has had the opportunity to play itself out. Um, Hamden County, Springfield, as we all know, has a reputation of um, doing some real bad things, the district attorney. And that's, which again, it's really important for people to see um, Al Jazeera's America, production of Joe Berlinger's the system, so they can see how systematically uh, our criminal justice system has really ran off track with overzealous police officers, district attorney, judges, and everything. Each episode has um, is about a different component of the criminal justice system uh, happening around the country, and uh, there's, there's a lot of innocent people have been locked up or disappeared for 25, 30 years under some of the similar circumstances. So people see, need to see this documentary so they can really be educated about what's what's going on on a different level. So if if people, if our listeners are are moved by your story, are are wanting to support you, but beyond simply supporting Donald Perry, who I think we all want to support, it's it's also to look beyond you, to look at this system that is both fixed and broken. And broken. And so how, what are some, some ways people can get involved to, uh, to address this, to, uh, to speak out? Well, um, we're uh, we're collaborating with um, a rise for social justice out of Springfield and um, out now and a few other organizations and so people they can contact them or they can contact me at justiceforDonald.org justiceforDonald.org yes I mean and there's always there's a lot of information links on there about how they can get involved in different things um, there's a lot, and that's one of the things that we. Um, I was successful as a service provider because I came into the community and I said, "Listen, <clears throat> how can all of us, different agencies, complement one another's efforts? So we need to form a collaboration. I'm trying to formulate the same collaboration around the state with all of the different agencies." that's in, engaged in restorative justice, prison reform, and all this kind of stuff. So we can um, complement one another's efforts. And there is definitely work for people to, to do. So if they're really interested, they, as I said, they can contact Arise, Out Now, you know, me, you know, they can uh, friend us on Facebook, you know what I mean? And there's always work to be done. Yeah. I, I think your, your your trial, which, and I again, that shout out to Holly Richardson, who, who got me and a number of us involved in in your case, and and not only having that personalist connection to you and Elaine, and uh, and wanting to support you through this, and finding that the the usual avenues of support, writing letters, calling, um, in fact, worked against you. In, in light of the way the parole board was operating. But, well, well, that's because, and that's, that's, I'm, I'm glad that you bring up that point because uh, uh, we're talking about the abuse of power and then domestic re relationships, a uh, key to abuse of power is shaming the, the individual where he or she won't come forward, isolating them, you know what I mean? And then that's how people are, are able to do that. And, um, there's a lot of people out there who are on probation or parole, and they don't need to be ashamed. They can they can come forward. There's people there to su support them or to support their loved ones. We're we're about out of time, Donald. Um, listeners, you are still listening to WXOJLP. This is Pocky Willand, and my guest today has been Donald Perry, who uh, who has been victimized by this system by our incredibly racist system and who is uh, who is surviving and thriving because he has our community 
Bye for now. Thank you.